All right, welcome uh, to Spark uh, AI Summit 2020. Uh, my name is uh, Jatinder Asi. I manage data engineering team at GumGum. My co-speaker is Rashmina Menon. She's a data engineer at GumGum. Uh, today we'll be talking about real-time forecasting at scale using Delta Lake and Delta Caching. All right, so let's get started. Uh, just a quick introduction about GumGum. So we are an AI company. We're located in Santa Monica, California. So our divisions are advertising where we leverage our computer vision and NLP technology to detect unsafe text and imagery, allowing us to deliver ads in a brand safe and a contextually relevant environment. Our second vertical is sports valuation where we help marketers and right media holders capture the full media value of sponsorship across broadcast TV, streaming and social media. So to, uh, the agenda we will cover today is a programmatic inventory intro, just, uh, just high level overview what a programmatic inventory looks like uh, and the scale that we are talking about. Then we'll talk about the architecture uh, for real time forecasting. And then we'll talk about data sampling approach that we took. Uh, then Rashmina will take over. She will talk about search and forecast application, uh, data caching with Delta and forecast accuracy. programmatic inventory intro. Uh, so let's talk about what is an advertising inventory. So it's a real estate to show potential ads in a publisher page. An ad can be of different forms and different formats and it, it uh, appears across different uh, formats like mobile, desktop, and web browser. So let's talk about programmatic advertising ecosystem. So it's a technology ecosystem to automatically buy and sell targeted online advertising in real time. So on one side of the side of the spectrum, we have publishers. These are some of the publishers that we work with or uh, who produce quality content. On the other side of the spectrum, we have advertisers. These are some of the brands that we work with who are looking for cost-effective ways to place media buys. Uh, all the advertisers integrated with DSPs. These are demand side partners. These are some of the popular demand side partners that GumGum works with. Uh, these are the partners who will actually participate in the bid on behalf of the advertiser. All the DSPs uh, work with ad exchanges. Uh, GumGum is one of the ad exchange where the auction will actually happen. So during the auction, a publisher will make their inventory available. Uh, and in that auction, all the DSPs get to bid on that inventory. Whoever wins the bid will actually gets to display the ad. All right, so let's talk about why forecast inventory. Uh, so our sellers are trying to set up ad campaigns with certain targeted rules, and we'd like to know if GumGum's Gum Gum publisher network has enough inventory to fulfill it. We also would like to provide faster response time to the forecast to allow our sellers to iterate, propose, and sell ad campaigns faster. So let's look at some of the scenarios. So here's a scenario where we want to forecast inventory available in US, in cities Los Angeles and San Diego from premium websites for next 30 days. So that's one of the scenario. Another scenario could be forecast inventory in US and Canada for pages related to sports and entertainment category, uh, targeting males of age 25 to 40. So let's talk about the scale. Uh, as I mentioned, so the, in order to forecast inventory, our goal is to be able to set up campaigns for success by generating near real-time forecast on the inventory. So the scale we are talking about here is uh, we roughly get 30 billion plus programmatic inventory every day via a programmatic ecosystem that I mentioned. That amounts to about 25 terabytes uh, compressed data per day. And uh, our goal is to be able to provide average or forecast response time of 30 seconds. So let's uh, jump into the architecture. All right, so all the data for inventory is sitting in S3 in raw format. All this data is in Avro format. The first module is uh, data transform. Uh, so this is a Spark module, which will read every day, 25 plus terabytes of data apply uh, apply transformation on this data, uh, which is pretty much cleaning, prepping, and then applying business rules uh, to transform this data. Once the transformation is complete, 
we will actually run sampling algorithm in Spark in a distributed fashion. Uh, where we'll, we will significantly reduce the amount of data. The next module will be enrichment. So uh, after we have samples from on a daily basis, we will enrich the samples uh, by enriching that data via uh, DynamoDB and MySQL data sets. After enrichment, all the data gets reduced to, after sampling and enrichment, the data gets re reduced to roughly 1.5 uh, gigs per day in Delta format. We'll store all that data in Delta Lake on a daily basis. Rashmina will go on details why we chose Delta format and Delta Lake. All this is uh, encapsulated in a daily data pipeline. All these modules are Spark modules and they run on a daily basis in Airflow. Uh, so let's say a, a user is ready to forecast with their uh, targeting criteria. So they will go to our internal dashboard. The internal dashboard internally will make uh, a search query. Uh, it's a Spark module which will search the samples based on the user criteria for past 365 days. So the search module will search the samples for past 365 days. Once we get the filter samples, then we will apply that to a forecasting model. This is an R model running on Spark driver. Rashmina will go in detail which model we end up using for time series forecasting. Once we apply the forecast model, we will get the forecasting results and we will display to our user in the internal dashboard. So end-to-end -end, uh, real-time forecast with this architecture, we are able to get within 30 seconds response time on the on 25 terabytes of data that we process every day, reducing to 1.5 gigs. Uh, and running this forecast for past 365 days, uh, we can get response time within 30 seconds. All right, so let's talk about data sampling now. So why sample? That's a pretty obvious question. So we don't want to waste a lot of compute in processing all of the inventory for past 365 days, which will be north of nine petabytes of data. And also it will be hard to attain 30 seconds of forecasting response time, even with most optimized forecasting model. So instead we can pre-process the, the, the impressions per day using a distributed sampling approach uh, to capture most relevant subset of the inventory population. So what I mean by that is the big circle here is actual uh, all the inventory and the small circle is capturing relevant subset uh, of, of the inventory and that's our sample data. So the sampling approach. So let's say a user uh, wants to query a data. Usually in a non-sample approach, you will go to a base data, query the base data and you will get the exact results. In case of sampling, we will generate a sample data, which is generated from the base data using a sampling algorithm. So when the user wants to query, they will query the sample data. And uh, once the user queries the sample data, we will use an estimator, which is a scale up factor, which is also generated as part of sample data. We will use a, this estimator to scale the results uh, back to the original data set. So a user queries the sample data, we use the estimator to scale the results up so the results will be relatable to the exact results. So we will get approximate results, which will be relatable to exact results. So let's talk about types of sampling. So a most common form of sampling is uniform sampling. This is where there's an equal probability of selecting any particular item. The problem here is it will be biased towards commonly occurring items. So which is not great for frequency cap. Uh, frequency cap is a, Frequency cap is one of the key factors in how gum gum serve ads, where we don't show ad to the same user frequently. We can, our, our criteria could be uh, set frequency cap once an hour or once a day. We won't show you same user uh, ad, ads more than once a day or more than once an hour based on frequency cap. So we uh, end up using a slightly modified version of this, which is distinct item sampling. So uh, in this approach, we will still sample uniformly, but from distinct items to support the frequency cap use case. So, so in this case, distinct item in our use case would be we can identify a distinct user by their user IP hash of user ID. So algorithm we end up using here is augmented min hash distinct item sampling where we will keep up to M distinct items uh, uh, per, per sample. All right, so let's talk about the sampling daily job. So uh, the sampling is parallelized for every single hour individually, and then separate hours are combined to form a daily sample. So let's see how it looks in action. 
So we have uh, all these orange buckets are raw data, hourly data sitting in S3. Then in Spark, we will parallelize all these hour processing of all these hours in parallel and generate sampled hours. So all the red buckets are actual sample data for every single hour with up to M distinct hash values. So then we will group by all these hourly samples uh, by the hash values and generate a pre-daily sample. Once we have the pre-daily sample, then we'll sort and take up to M smallest hash values to generate a daily sample. And also we will generate a scalar factor uh, using this algorithm, which will be used later on to relate the result of sample back to the original data set. All right, so next up will be Rashmina. She will talk about search and forecast application. Thanks, Jatinder. So I'm going to dive right into search and forecast application. So let's take a look at the end-to-end -end workflow of search and forecast application from left to right. So on the left, we have a user who is submitting a forecast request from dashboard. There is a thin layer of API which connects the user to the search and forecast application. The functionality of this API layer is to submit the Spark job using the Databricks jobs API and to get the results back from the Spark job and give it back to the user. Let's talk about the search and forecast application. So the search and forecast application, as the name implies, has two components in it, search application and the forecast application. I'm going to talk in detail about each of these applications, but search application and forecasting application put together has to complete within 30 seconds. That's the SLA that we are bound to achieve. So let's zoom into search application. The goal of the search application is to read past 365 days of sample data along with the multiply data, filter the sample data based on the user inputs, and then generate the time series of the form impressions per day, where number of impressions is number of sampled impressions times multiplier. So here comes an important question. Where does the search application read the data from? Which takes us to the next slide, data caching. The important question here is whether we should cache the data or not cache the data. And if we are indeed caching the data, what, what is the technology that we should use? So suppose we're not caching the data, suppose for every single forecasting request, we are reading the data directly from S3. Of course, we are not going to have too much cost, but this is going to be terribly slow. We cannot guarantee on the SLA. So we got to cache the data somewhere. We are working on Spark. So we all know Spark works great with in-memory cache. This is going to be lightning fast, but the caveat here is that we'll need a humongous cluster to cache the entire data in memory, especially for the scale at which we operate in. Also remember that the sampling pipelines are running once a day. So we'll have to refresh this in-memory cache daily, which is a bit tedious. So what's the alternate choice we have? The obvious choice is disk caching. This, as we know, is cheaper than memory. Using disk caching also means that we could utilize the memory for compute, which is great. But coming to the point, it's not very efficient. We saw that if we were to use disk caching, we will at least need 35 C42X large nodes. The question is, can we do better? Can we reduce the number of instances so that we can reduce the cost? Now, similar to in-memory caching, disk caching also needs daily refresh. So let's come to the question, can we do better than disk caching? The answer is yes. And the, this is through Delta Lake with Delta Cache. Let's refresh about Delta Lake. Delta Lake is an open source storage layer that brings asset transactions to Spark. The basic idea is that your streaming application and batch application can write to Delta Lake. You can use the cloud storage, whichever you're using. Here we are using AWS S3. And the analytics and machine learning applications can read seamlessly from Delta Lake without having to worry if the asset properties are maintained. Delta Lake works on the notion of transaction log. So the transaction log in Delta Lake keeps a record of every single transaction that's happening on Delta Lake. So when the sampling data pipelines are writing to Delta Lake, the tables are already aware that there is already new data available and it will refresh the underlying tables automatically, which is great. Writing to Delta Lake is pretty straightforward. Generally, when we write data frame, we specify the format option which we are using, whether it be Parquet, JSON, TSV, 
If we do the same for Delta Lake, we specify Delta as a format. Now that we know what format we are using, let's come to the question, what's the caching layer that we are going to use? The caching layer which we are going to use is Delta caching on Databricks. Delta caching on Databricks is basically disk caching, but it supports accelerated data rates by creating copies of remote files in nodes local storage using a fast intermediate format. So this fast intermediate format is faster than disk caching. Delta caching is enabled by default on i3x large instances, which, are, that which we are using for our use case. Now, once we start using a cluster where Delta caching is enabled and we start reading from Delta Lake, we can see interesting statistics under the storage tab in this Spark UI. We can see how much data is read from S3. We can see how much data is read to the cache, how much data is getting, getting repeatedly read, and so on. So all these parameters will later help us to tune the application. Let's look at the common commands that are getting used to create the Delta table and to enable the Delta caching. So creating a Delta table is very straightforward. We can use the create table statement. We can point to the S3 location and we're done. We have the samples data table created. Now to cache the Delta Lake onto your cluster, we use the cache command followed by the select statement. Here we are caching the sampling, sample data uh, which we get for the last 365 days and hence the work loss. To refresh the cache associated with the table, we use the refresh table statement. Now let's look at the common commands that we use to run maintenance operations on Delta Lake. One important command is optimize command. Now for all of us who work on Spark, we know how important it is to get the file size correct, how important it is to get the number of files correct. Optimize command comes really handy for this particular use case because the command will compact the files to one GB file size. We can also specify Z order, which will co-locate same information on same set of files. Now to delete the already compacted files, we can run the vacuum command. Analyze table command is also impo equally important. Analyze uh, table command will help the query analyzer collect statistics about the table, which will help uh, the query to be performing. Now, how often you run these commands depends on your use case, but for us, we run these commands every single day. So coming back to the question, whether to cache or not to cache, we have an answer. We are using Delta Lake with Delta Cache. So since this Delta Cache is similar to disk caching, but with increased performance, we get an opportunity to utilize the memory for compute. This is also the least expensive option that we nailed down. So to, rem uh, to remind you, with this caching, we were using 35 C42X slash nodes. Now with Delta Lake and Delta caching, we could reduce this to 20 I3X slash nodes. So from the cost perspective, this works great. But one caveat is that the warm-up queries can take longer if we are not refreshing the cache. So this is how the basic search application architecture looks like. Search application is a Spark shop which reads the data which is cached on cluster. The caching layer is basically Delta caching on Databricks. The data format which we use is Delta Lake and the Delta Lake data is stored on S3. Let's revisit the entire workflow once again for search, search application. So the first step is to basically filter the sample data for the user inputs. So the basic inputs which user provides a date, product, and bidder, which are partition keys for our S3 data. So we do first level of filtering here by applying the part the use by applying filter on the user inputs based on the partition keys. The second step is to further filter this data based on other user inputs. Examples uh, would be country, browser type, third party segments, page categories, and so on. We have 50 to 60 user inputs that the user can enter through the dashboard. The last step is to aggregate this and generate the time series data. 
So if frequency cap is present, we cap the number of impression per user at the frequency cap. Later, we aggregate this data to build the time series uh, of the form impressions per day. We multiply the sample number of impressions with the multiplier to get the projected impressions. So this is all about the search application. Let's move on to the next part of the search and forecasting application, which is a forecasting application. The goal of the forecasting application is to forecast the time series for the next n days based on the time series trends in past 365 days. So we know that the search application is spitting out a time series for the last 365 days. Our goal is to generate the forecast for next n number of days. Our time series forecasting model is written in R and we use ARIMA as the base model. ARIMA is nothing but autoregressive integrated moving average. It's a very popular and common time series forecasting model. It is used to describe the autocorrelation in data. And the variant which we are using is a non seasonal one. But here comes an important question. The kind of targeting rules that the user can enter for a campaign A will differ entirely for a campaign B. So how do we use the same ARIMA model for different trends? So the question which we're trying to answer is, how do we generate different ARIMA models for different user inputs which result in different time series? For this, we use auto ARIMA. So auto ARIMA finds the best ARIMA model for a given time series. So for a given time series X, if the targeting rules are entirely different from another time series Y, we are getting different models because auto ARIMA is finding different parameters to fit both these time series. Let's look at the other models which we are using for our um, forecasting. For all of us in ad tech, we know that trends vary drastically from quarter to quarter for ad tech. One trend which is very important for us is quarterly trends. So the data which we have or the traffic trend which we have in Q1 is entirely different for the, uh, when compared to the data in Q4. So quarterly trend is very important. We capture the quarterly trend using sinusoids. We also capture the weekly trend using sinusoids. So the auto ARIMA, weekly trend, quarterly trend put together combines the basic forecasting model that we are using. We run the forecasting model on the driver node and our average forecast execution time is less than two seconds. So you can imagine that within the 30 second SLA, the most time is taken by the search application because the forecasting application on its own is really fast, even if it runs only on the driver node. So suppose the black line here represents the actual and the blue line represents the forecast. How do we know if the forecast is actually good enough? Of course, we have to measure the forecasting accuracy. We compute the mean absolute percentage error for predefined forecasting requests. As I mentioned previously, we have 50 to 60 targeting rules that the user can enter through dashboard. So it's very difficult for us to generate all the permutation and combination of the inputs that the user can enter. So we predefine certain forecasting requests which are very common from our sellers and we compute the mean absolute percentage error for these forecasting requests time over time. So the mean absolute percentage error is defined as an error over actual. So A here stands for actual, F stands for forecast. We compute uh, actual minus forecast, which is the error. We divide it by actual and we get the average for N observations. And that's mean absolute percentage error. So we compute mean absolute percentage error every single day for these predefined forecasting requests. And we uh, ensure that this doesn't go above the threshold that we want to achieve. And for now, we have been, we have never got alerts for the longest time. So we know that the model is really functioning well. So that's all about our forecasting application. Thank you for listening to our presentation. With that, we open to Q&A.